my name is Tanu Graywall. I am the Vice President of Marketing and Innovation at Allen USA, and I'm the 2019 winner of the Industry Excellence Award in Consumer Products. I'm here with Robert Foy, the 2020 winner of the Industry Excellence Award in Consumer Products, and the CEO of Accolade Vines. Robert, thank you so much for joining us and to talk about your career and the future state of our industry. So let's get started. Uh, there's a lot of questions that I have that I'm sure uh, folks who are listening to this will be also interested in. Let's get started about, you know, just your journey to Rice uh, business. Uh, how did you end up choosing uh, to come to Rice MBA? Thanks, Ty. Thanks. Great to be here. Um, I took a little bit different route than most people, probably, because I was one of those, uh, you know, less than 15% who go straight from undergrad into MBA. Uh, and it started off with, with a very simple situation where I learned how to study and got really interested in school. <laughs> and, and that didn't happen until I was a junior in college. So once that happened, you know, moving to an MBA was interesting. But more importantly, I had a, a couple of job offers and they were good job offers. But I looked at the future and there were two real things that, that came out to me. Uh, one was investing in my future. And I, I feel like with a with a Rice MBA, um, you're 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 making a very big investment up front, but it's going to stay with you for the next thirty or forty year, years in your career. Um, and the second one, I've always done this uh, since then, is keep my options open. Mm -hmm. And I felt like taking one of those jobs right out of undergrad and doing that was going to kind of put me on a on a on a course and and probably reduce my options. And going to Rice uh, with a reputation, uh, Rice MBA with a reputation it had, gave me all kinds of other options. Um, so it, it really fit into what I needed at the time. That's great. And I couldn't agree with you more about, you know, just Rice and the platform that it gives you is, is just immense. And I, I can, uh, you know, echo the same experience. So when you think back to your time uh, and experiences at Rice Business, what part of that experience do you think had the most impact on you? Well, probably about 10 things, but I think about two to three things were really interesting uh, and totally different. One was the diversity uh, and the diversity, not just in terms of, you know, race and gender and all that, but in terms of uh, people's backgrounds and experiences. I mean, my first year in the business school, I'd be sitting next to someone who maybe had been a teacher uh, and had never taken any kind of statistics or quant classes, but they wanted to do something you know, broader in education. And to the left of me might be an investment banker from Morgan Stanley. And you had that kind of total mix. And of course me, sitting there with who had just had some internships and you had a total broad mix of people. And I, I mean, that totally made the discussions and the thinking and the approaches to problems totally different. And I think it more represented the real world, you know, out there, which is the diversity you get. And I think there were two other key things. One was uh, the group work and working in groups and what you find, I mean, our, our company Accolade Wines, we have 1400 employees. I mean, there's no such thing as, you know, Robert Foy or the CEO doing any anywhere near uh, most of the work. <laughs> it's done by groups of employees. And, and at Rice, I learned, you know, how do you harness that? How do you uh, work with groups in a way that everyone feels like they're moving forward and achieving something and getting the best outcome? Uh, and then by far, the, the, the most important thing uh, coming out of it also was public speaking. Uh, and, and it's something that I talk about, um, that, that is something that everyone should get really, really good at because it's so important because you've got to communicate your ideas, whether it's in a meeting with four people or whether it's in a town hall with, you know, 400 people. Uh, and I always go back to, uh, Warren Buffett who said the most important course he took, uh, was a public speaking course. It wasn't any of his finance courses uh or anything else so so those three things really stood out for me for rice and prepared me for the rest of my career that's a great point robert about public speaking i, I couldn't agree more with you about you know you can have clarity of thoughts but if you don't have the articulation and a big part of leadership is so much about persuasion right and i think that that is a really 
um, handy skill. And uh, I, I recall my time at Rice and going to the public speaking course as well. It was a little painful in the beginning, uh, but you know, to see yourself on, on on a recording and kind of going through those ahs and ums, but definitely, uh, you know, was very, very uh, beneficial in my career as well. Yep. So, so you graduate from Rice MBA, uh, and then, you know, just walk us through what happens and then how, how did you end up in the wine industry? Yeah, so keeping that theme of options. Um, I had a couple of uh, offers in different industries coming out of Rice, and I had one with Deloitte and Touche Consulting, <laughs> which uh, turned out to be really interesting, very hard working place, uh, very long hours, lots of travel. Uh, but the most important thing was, again, options. Uh, it allowed me to, uh, those first couple of years of my career, you know, get my CPA, uh, get my CFA, you know, get my CMA and kind of finish off the investment side uh, of my career for the future uh, or the base of it. Uh, but it also allowed me to see a lot of different places. And, and after being there for a couple of years and doing these consulting projects, which were great, where you kind of came up with all of the recommendations and then you kind of left <laughs> and, you, and, and a year later in half the projects, people would say, yeah, that recommendation was great and we implemented it. And the other half, they'd say, oh, well, management changed and we didn't you know, implement any of it. Right. So, um, so I had a chance. It was kind of funny. Old school. I answered an ad in the paper for Coca-Cola Foods, which was actually the Minute Maid company in Houston, senior financial analyst. You know, they got all these resumes. I was lucky enough to be one of the finalists. And I think, again, because I went to Rice MBA, because I had put the work in on the CPA, because I worked for Doyle & Touche, they gave me the job. And for me, that was the move into, you know, fast-moving consumer goods, FMCG uh, consumer goods. And, and what's most interesting about that industry to me is it's real, you know, you touch it, you feel it, you mm -hmm. know, you can talk to people about it. And since then, I've always worked with a product where someone could say, hey, where can I buy that product? Or they try it and then they give me feedback. And that was the real interesting part of that. Uh, I think the other interesting part about FMCG is it's fast, it's innovative, it's constantly changing. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. Um, and it, it's, it's a, it's a business that has, I would say bricks and mortar because you actually have to, you know, build things, uh, create things, manufacture them. Uh, but it also has a digital world where you're talking to consumers and customers digitally. Uh, and so, so it's got the best of both worlds and, and touching and feeling that product was always interesting to me. And so then, um, you know, uh, I noticed in your career path, you spent about 22 years at Coca-Cola and then you got into the wine industry and, you know, sounds very glamorous from the outside. Just give us a little peek behind the curtain of, right? You know, what, what is the, you know, uh, the truth behind the, the glamour? <laughs> well, the truth behind the glamour is I read that, you know, Jesus turned water into wine, not Coca-Cola. And therefore I had <laughs> to make it to the wine industry eventually. No, I'm just to totally joking. The, the truth behind the glamour is, uh, first, there is no glamour. 22 years at Coke was an amazing career. Uh, you know, we, we were overseas for 19 years. I spent 16 years in Asia. Uh, so we worked in Houston six years. Uh, I'm talking about me and my family. Mm -hmm. uh, then went to Hong Kong for three years. Then, Lo then London three years. Then Indonesia six years. Then China eight years. And the, and the theme that I would say in that journey was, you know, taking risk and always wanting to learn and take on the next challenge. And every time, you know, I would come home and, you know, talk to the wife about, you know, hey, we're going to leave everything behind <laughs> in London <laughs> and we're going to go to Indonesia and I'm going to have a totally new job and we're going to, you know, and I'm going to be general manager there rather than, you know, head of non-carbonated beverages for, for a few regions. And the kids are going to all go to new schools and everything else. I mean, you can imagine the discussions, but, you know, we, we partnered together and the experiences uh, and, and everything that came out of that life in business and in life could not be replicated any other way. So, so there I would say constantly look for learning constantly look for challenges there's no challenge you can't 
uh, do, and there's no challenge you can't overcome. Uh, and don't get overwhelmed by the, you know, the bigness of the challenge or the difficulty or, or the, the life changes. And, and, and there was a life piece to this too, which is, you know, I, I ended up with uh, four kids, two sons from me and two adopted daughters, uh, one from uh, Indonesia, one from Jakarta and one from China. Um, and I guarantee you, had I stayed in the U.S., I probably would have two kids. I probably would have two sons. And so there's that, not just that richness in terms of business, but the richness in terms of life. And then, you know, there's that old saying that you create your own luck. And I think that's true too. Because of all those experiences, I had met quite a few people in Coke who uh, left the company and did other things. And that's what really led to wine because the company that I went to at the time, which was Treasury Wine Estates, they were an Australian company focused mainly on Australia and some on the US uh, because they had brands located in each place. They didn't really know anything about Asia uh, and they didn't really know what to do in Europe. And because of my experience at Coke, uh, they said, look, you don't have any wine experience, but we know you know how to build businesses in Asia and Europe. And that's what led to that. Mm. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about some challenges at the end of that um, you know, at the end of that job, which led to other even bigger opportunities at Accolade Wines, which is great. Uh, but it's that openness to challenge. It's that, you know, it, it's, it's always tough. I mean, even now, if I think about a move or something, it's fearful, it's not easy, but just take it on and, uh, think about the long-term learning and experience you get. You can always come back to your comfort zone, uh, later whenever you want. That's such a great story. And I love the fact that you talked about all of those experiences really shaping not just your professional life, but your personal life as well, right? To have the gift of two daughters now from different countries that you were able to live in. Uh, that, that's just great. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about COVID, right? So COVID happens, um, you know, you're in the wine industry. What, what's happening? Because we're all seeing in FMCG, like you mentioned, it's fast moving. The, the, the consumer's expectations are evolving at warp speed. So, so what happened in the wine industry for you guys? Yeah, I mean, I would say two things happened. Uh, one was internal and one was external. <laughs> internal, same thing with every single other company. Uh, and, and, and most companies thought that, you know, if you're not at the office, you're not working, you know? And yeah, I've got these people and they want to take off a day or two and work from home. And I don't know if I'm really comfortable with that because I don't know what they're doing. True. Very true. <laughs> and, and that changed overnight. <laughs> Everybody's working from home. Had to. Yeah, it had to. So it was forced on the industry, uh, you know, on the, on the whole um, business sector. And, and that piece, honestly, people stepped up made it happen, you know, it created a lot of new tensions, which is mm -hmm. people felt like the workday never ended. You know, they wake up in the morning and then, you know, they're, they're on the Zoom and then at night they're kind of done, but they're not done because other people are doing more Zooms. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it led to a lot of kind of, I think that, that tension of, you know, where is my place, my workplace, mm -hmm. you know, because my wor workplace is in my home. Um, but what I would say there is that, you know, human creativity and human, uh, uh, you know, the ability to pivot came into place. And I'm sure it did. I mean, from what I've read, it happened at pretty much every organization. And our organization yes. didn't miss a beat. I, it's unbelievable how quickly they moved. Then you go external. And, and there were two big things there. One, and it's the same thing as other, other things. One is there was a massive shift in the channel. So suddenly it's supermarket, hypermarket, uh, and convenience store as opposed to uh, on-premise and restaurant. And we have different portfolios there and different supply chains and all that. So it's, it's, that, it's that flexibility and creativity again that people show and, you know, oh, we don't have enough stock in this, this product. We've got way too much in this. What are we going to do? And, and that's just day-to-day -day problem solving. And I would say, again, our organization got through that, that piece quickly i'd say 90 days we were set up running the new you know the new mix of business and then the last one uh which for me 
has been harder and it's that shift to digital. Mm -hmm. Uh, and how do we, you know, you know, how do we accelerate that? And we have accelerated it, but it's like everything in life. You're not going as fast as you want. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and we're, and we're kind of going through phase two now. Okay. We've, we've adjusted some, we're getting kind of our okay, fair share, but how do we turn this into really winning in that space? And that's the hardest part because, you know, our DNA starting off was not digital. You right. know, our DNA was bricks and mortars, talking to customers, distribution of, of things, and then having kind of a digital presence. And we've had to change that and keep that old DNA, but add on the new one. And that's always harder for companies. And, you know, the, the analogy for me of what we've gone through and what some companies may have gone through is, is the car industry, you know, where you've got, you know, like Tesla leading electric cars and they take it from a design and software point of view and, and old car manufacturers take it from a manufacturing and a, you know, design point of view without thinking of software is like the last thing they think about. Um, and it's very similar. Um, and, and, and so we're making that move even harder. Very interesting. And so this whole digital transformation, you know, in, even in the grocery industry, you know, we talk about how 10 years worth of growth happened in three months because it had to, right? Uh, and that, of course, has come with its own sets of challenges. Everybody's rushing to, you know, optimize their experiences in the digital world. Uh, so apart from this, you know, need to go digital, what are some of the other challenges that are facing your industry today or, you know, after COVID when, when it ends? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And um, so you've got the digital, there is definitely a challenge. The biggest challenge that I've seen uh, in FMCG, and it, it's the same for wine, but it's for FMCG, is kind of a mixture of two things, I think. There's a consolidation on the retail side. So mm -hmm. there's companies that ha on the retail side that have said, okay, we're going to win in the bricks and mortar and therefore we're going to buy other companies and we're going to consolidate that and we're going to get bigger and bigger, but we're also going to win in digital. And if we, if we have that consumer coming to our stores and we're consolidating and getting bigger and bigger, we're going to do the same on the digital side. So, so we're going to have, if we have a share of X in bricks and mortars, we want the same in digital. Mm -hmm. and that kind of pushes everything. And of course that makes the retail trade stronger and it makes it more difficult for FMCG. But I think a bigger challenge than that is the fact that the industry in a good way for the consumer has gotten a lot faster a lot more competitive, a lot more innovative. Right. And when you think about, you know, why has that happened? Uh, one of it's kind of natural with the digital and all that, but there's another reason, which is in the old days, there were huge barriers to entry. You know, you had to build a factory. Uh, you had to have scientists come up with a formula. Then you had to make a product, market it. And then you had to go and, and sort of have physical people on the ground and go sell it to every retailer now it's completely changed you can go to a flavor house and they can give you 10 different formulations with similar technology sometimes as the big players right you can co-pack your product you can do an online website you know and immediately see everyone <laughs> so that's good and bad for the industry but i think if you can run your company, your FMCG company, like a startup, if you can make decisions very fast, if you can innovate, if you can take out layers and not have bureaucracies, if you can have small teams drive the business similar to a small company, then you get the best of both worlds because you've got scale, you have some assets, you have money to invest in digital, but you're going as fast as your smallest competitor. If you don't do that, you know, the word is dinosaur. <laughs> You're in big trouble. And some of these bigger consumer products companies really struggle with that. And I think it's because of the history of the layers of management. And it's one reason that I left, you know, that big company scene and went into, you know, small cap, mid cap, FMCG, and in my case, wine, because it's just so much more dynamic. 
And I think you can read in the newspaper, you know, the Wall Street Journal or whatever, you can read about companies who are really struggling with that shift. And it takes them years to either make that jump and totally change how the company's doing, or they're just continuous poor performance uh, going forward. So it's a big challenge for the industry, but it's a, it's excellent for consumers. <laughs> I agree. And, you know, uh, my career trajectory has followed big company, big brands to small cap as well. And one of the biggest reasons I made that jump as well was exactly for that reason, right? That agility, that nimbleness to make decisions and innovate fast uh, is, is, is exactly what the market needs. And bigger companies just, you know, the bigger sh the ship it takes that much more time to move it around. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's excellent. And can um, you imagine yourself, uh, Tanu, can you imagine yourself some of the decisions you make now making those at your old company, right? You, <laughs> you I mean, know, I have, uh, yes, I have, a, I have a favorite story of how I was doing a project. I actually did an expat assignment in, in Europe and I came back and people were still working on the project and because, <laughs> because the European, uh, you know, organization was much, uh, much smaller. I had been able to go there, you know, start the same project from scratch, uh, execute it in the market, see the oh. results, and then come back and see that we were still working on the same project. So, uh, so yeah, and that's exactly what I tell my team today. You know, we are able to, uh, we launched a brand in a matter of two years from scratch, you know, consumer insight, white space, launching it in the marketplace. Uh, there's no way that it could have been replicated in a that's bigger a, That's a fantastic <laughs> story. And exactly why, again, you took that risk to go to Europe. I'm sure there are a lot of conversations with a lot of people like, what am I doing? Yes. And, and look at what you did. And then when you came back, you had that perspective of, we don't have to go slow. We don't, you know, and then you took that to your new companies. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, you know, what, what advice would you give to someone who's looking to, uh, you know, just have a career in FMCG or the wine industry specifically? Yeah. So the first advice I'd have is get an MBA from Rice. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't do that, then get an MBA from somewhere else. Uh, but but I think it goes back. I think it, uh, it goes into two buckets. And one I've already talked about, which is take risk. Don't be afraid to learn. You know, uh, mm -hmm. the worst case scenario is something doesn't work out and you go back to what you know and what you're doing. And that, that's totally exactly. fine. Uh, but the second one I would give is learn the business from the bottom up. So if you're, if you're interested in FMCG, you know, what kind of job is going to allow you to do sales for a little while, do marketing for a little while, do finance for a little while? Because the other thing that I find fascinating is, you know, one of my major competitors is run by someone who doesn't have any sales and marketing experience, hmm. you know, and and it's a real advantage for us exactly. uh, because myself and a lot of my management team has sales, marketing, supply chain, finance, all in one person, you know, or all in a group of people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very easy to make decisions and drive things. And I think that's about learning the business from the ground up. And again, that takes risk because sometimes exactly. you're very comfortable in finance or whatever, and you just want to do finance. And, and I remember when I, the first time I moved out of finance into business development and marketing, I was, you know, had the shakes at night and couldn't sleep. And what I realized is I can always go back to finance and I'd be a better finance person having done even a couple of years in sales and marketing. The reality is I found it too much fun ever to do finance again, other than I still tell my CFO, hey, I've got a CPA, so I know this, you know, or whatever. <laughs> But, but yeah, so that's, that's, that's the thing. And then the third thing is public speaking, get that public speaking your first couple of years in school or out of school, get it done. Once you got it done, you got it the rest of your life. Yeah. You know, that advice that you talked about learning the, the business and, and all aspects of it, that's not very conventional advice. In fact, when I tried to do that in my career, I got a lot of advice to the contrary. Well, don't do that. Don't go. I remember somebody said, don't go over to the dark side. <laughs> I, think, I think that when you understand the whole, you know, I used to call it the belly of the beast, right? The supply yes. chain, the operations, the customer service. Uh, it just empowers you so much totally. to ask the right questions later on. Absolutely. Absolutely. You couldn't have said it better. So, so great. And so, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you have such a rich career, uh, Robert, and I have so many questions 
Uh, but really, what accomplishment in your career uh, would you say you're most proud of? Yeah, I would say there's there's two. Uh, one is family, and and it, it, you know it's tough. To, it, it's kind of funny because you say, well, what's your what's your accomplishment? And I could talk about you know building the Asian business for my old company, and you know uh, rejuvenating Accolade Wines and making it into a real fighter company, which is all great. But for me, it's 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 the four kids and the family and and building something that um, you know I didn't expect and building such a diverse family. And then the second thing for me, honestly, is resilience. And this is another message that I want people to have. No matter how well you plan out your life and career, you're going to, you're going to have a really some nasty experiences. And in my case, uh, my oldest son died three years ago, totally unexpected. Uh, and you know, we, we could have fallen apart as a family or we could have come closer together. And then about a year after that, I was fired at my old job. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you can imagine I'm coming back to Houston, you know, I've lost a son, I've lost a job. A lot of people just kind of say, okay, well, that's it. I'm just gonna, you know, get my hole. And uh, our family decided, no, let's go for, you know, let's, let's turn it into a positive. And so we did two things. One is let's find another job that's even better, which I've done. Now I'm CEO of Accolade Wines owned by Carlisle. Uh, incredible company, number one Australian uh, uh, wine company, and and we're building on that. Uh, and I and it's the perfect job for me. Couldn't be more excited. And the second thing is, you know, how do we turn that into a positive? So um, one of my future goals is to build up, and we've already started a million dollar scholarship fund at Trinity uh, University and a million dollar scholarship fund at HBU. Uh, and, and we're definitely going to do that. We we've started it and I've, we've committed to it as a family and that's going to allow other kids who are looking at, you know, getting educated, uh, to have the same kind of opportunities that I had, the same kind of options I had where they can look at the world and say, Hey, I'm prepared. Um, so that's the minimum we're going to do, but we'll, we'll probably do more than that, but resilience, you know, if you get fired, if something happens in your family and someone passes away or whatever, unfortunately, that's part of life. And, and you know, how you deal with that and how you turn it into a positive is the real key to success. And if you do that, you can be more successful than if you just say, hey, when times are good, I'm going to just keep riding it. <laughs> and when times are bad, I'm going to kind of give up or, you know, do something else or not think about it. Uh, so that would be my big accomplishment. And, um, and I'm proud of all that. That's just such a tremendous story, Robert. I, um, I mean, kudos to you and your family that, you know, when you mentioned the first challenge and, and then the second one, sometimes life can seem like, you know, you're kind of being thrown the lemons, but then yeah. how do you make lemonade out of it is <laughs> it's a true test. Yeah. Uh, really it just uh, a tremendous, tremendous story there. Uh, so yeah. we're kind of ending up, you know, uh, towards the, the creeping up towards the end here, but, you know, just uh, uh, what other things do you want to accomplish before you retire? Or maybe you never want to retire. And <laughs> just, uh, you know, what, what's the plan? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to ever retire in the sense that I wouldn't mind being on a few boards and it's really about continuing that incredible ability to influence people uh, and, and also develop people. That's my real passion. Uh, but I would say three three more things to do. One, real quickly, I want to do an IPO. And that's what we're going to do at Accolade One. So we're going to do that in the next two to three years. That's exciting. Uh, either on the Australian Stock Exchange or actually I want to do it on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. That's been mm. a dream of mine to bring a company to an Asian Stock Exchange. Second, I want to develop the people and the team such that people, uh, when I go on the board or when I leave and and go on other boards that people say, Working with Robert, that was the best job I've ever had in my career. I got paid the most. It was the most exciting, the most dynamic. Uh, and then the last thing is I want to, you know, make enough money to make those scholarships happen and, um, and even more than that. And if I can do all that, that's a pretty good run for, uh, is, for run yes. number three. <laughs> it's a pretty good run. I think that, you know, I have learned so much from you just in this short conversation. I think you have such a tremendous amount of experience and, you know, living and working in, you know, different regions and different industries, your own personal life experiences. I, I, I think you have a lot to offer to boards and, 
and companies. And all the best for your IPO. Uh, we'll be we'll be looking out for that uh, and uh, looking to see what's what's next in your career. I'm sure there's a lot of exciting things to come. Uh, and I think with that, I'm going to just you know close this here with a big thanks to people who've uh, you know tuned in to listen to this. Hopefully, you got a lot of great nuggets from this. Uh, thanks for spending your lunch hour with us and uh, all the best for the remaining alumni reunion week. Thank you. And thank, and thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you.